Welcome everyone to your Maverick Trading Psychology with Doc Halliday. It's actually spelled Holiday, and I always get called Holiday, so I kind of respond to both. But we've always pronounced it Halliday. I'm not quite sure why that is. If you just take the the word H A L L, certainly spells Hall I Day. I'm not sure why that is, but anyway, uh, we're going to go through psychology and. In terms of psychology, a lot of the things that you potentially do that cause you problems in the financially mar in the financial markets are psychologically based. You'll notice that there are some biases that you have as we go throughout these presentations. You'll notice that from time to time you anchor to past events or prior price points that are not statistically significant to your trade and should not be anchored to. You'll notice that you uh, from time to time go out and seek confirmation bias. And so a lot of the things that we're going to talk about and really hit hard are improving the way you think about the markets improving the psychological uh, aspects of, of making decisions in the financial markets. We presented this for the first time in Vegas and I've put this together to really give you some better insights into how professional traders think about the markets. Sometimes it's very counterintuitive. We'll talk about that as well. Sometimes it's about making the hard decisions, taking the hard trade, which is a big thing that I emphasize. So Corey Halliday here with you. Let's jump in. Now, investing psychology, a man should never be ashamed to say he has been wrong, which is but saying, in other words, that he is wiser today than he was yesterday. What a great saying that is. In trading, how often do we worry about whether we're right or we're wrong, right? We think that being wrong is akin to disaster, and that's just not true. In the financial markets, in any game of chance, you're going to be wrong sometimes. Even if we had, you know, if you think about a coin flip, if a coin flip lands on heads 50% of the time and tails 50% of the time, isn't it true that you will have strings where it lands heads seven, eight times in a row? Or tails, you know, five, ten times in a row? That will happen. So in any scenario, there will be strings, there will be times when something is wrong, and that's okay. In the financial markets, you have to take your ego and put it on the side. And, and so, you know, from my own background, I grew up with, with brothers and we would argue about everything, right? And we always called it the holiday guarantee because we would always say things and then we would argue and we would all say, I guarantee it, I guarantee I'm right. And that was what we always referenced as the holiday guarantee. Well, needless to say, this was before you could Google everything at an instant. And now with Google, unfortunately, you can call someone's bluff quite quickly. I guarantee I'm right, they Google it. Nope, not quite right, okay? We get, it used to be you could argue about these things for days. Now, unfortunately, you can't hardly argue anything anymore because Google will tell you the answer within moments. We have to be able to say, if we figure out that we're wrong, that what we thought was right is wrong, we just move on. We accept that. We actually are okay with that. And that comes back to cutting losses, managing risk. It, it actually makes you wiser to be able to accept when you're wrong and when you're right. And any professional investor, I promise you, they don't stay in their wrong trades and their wrong ideas and just keep fighting against it over and over and over again because there will be times where their thesis, their expectation is absolutely wrong. So what are some common mistakes and what are we going to avoid? Well, plan your trade, trade your plan. If you're trading without a plan, what you're basically doing is going into the markets and saying, I think I'm going to be able to feel my way through. I think I'm going to be able to just kind of sense and get a feel for when I should sell or when I should buy. I'm telling you right now, nothing could be further from the truth. Now, we are going to talk about how you feel about certain positions, but oddly enough, you want to flip those, you want to flip the switch on that. There's a great Seinfeld episode where George Costanza does the opposite of everything he thinks, right? And it really works out for him. And in trading, it's much that same way, where we, if we actually do 
the opposite of how we feel in a lot of these situations, we're much better off. But we have to be working from a solid framework. So trading with a plan is basically saying, here are the factors that I'm going to be looking for. One of the first and most important thing I tell any new trader is trade with the trend. Everyone want to pre everyone wants to predict the next big trend change, but trading with the trend is very important because you have momentum. And at the end of the day, we're all trying to find supply and demand where it's going to increase. It's far more likely that demand is going to increase as prices rise and supply is going to increase as prices fall. And the reason that happens is that the markets are set up that way. Think about it. If an asset is falling, as a stock starts to fall, it will trigger automatic sell orders, further perpetuating the selling. In addition, it's probably selling off because there's you know, bad fundamentals. Somebody knows something. Even though you don't know it right now, they've caught wind of something. That's part of why it's selling. As you continue to sell off and the sell off intensifies, then there's forced liquidations, margin calls. In other words, buying begets more buying and selling simply begets more selling. So don't go into the markets with strong uh, biases. Sometimes we, we have a bias, you know, one that's very pervasive the past few years has been an anti-Fed bias. We think that the Federal Reserve is out to just kind of collapse the market to a certain extent, or they're so ignorant about things that they're making very bad decisions. You know what? Your opinion might be proven right on any scenario longer term, but I can tell you any bias that way will cloud your judgment. It will make you so that it's personal. And once something becomes personal and your opinion is so personal that if it's not working out, it actually starts to affect you as a human being. It starts to, you know, really, you, you take it so personal that it's almost like they're attacking you individually. You will not make good decisions. You will have clouded judgment. Poor risk management, cutting profits too short, letting, winter, uh, letting losses pile up and keep running, impatience, fearful reactions to short-term moves, unrealistic expectations, lack of diversification, trading against the trend, trying to pick tops and bottoms, and focusing only on being right. Uh, great trader here at Maverick, Joe, once said, not worried about being right, I just want to make money. And that is the way we want you to to come into the markets. We want you to have an open mind, uh, willingness to take the hard trade, the one that goes against common uh, expectations, that goes against the, the, not against the trend, understand. We want to trade with price action, but a lot of times I always tell people, look, if you're looking for my favorite trade, it's to be with the hated trend. A lot of times the average individual will hate certain areas of the market, right? They'll say, well, there's no, you know, that's so overvalued. And this becomes a common theme where everybody thinks the same thing, yet it keeps trending. There's, no, there's nothing that feels better to me than being in a hated trend. Most people think they want to be where everybody loves something. Logic tells you if everybody is in love with the same area, that creates risk. But if everybody hates it and it's running higher, that creates opportunity for it to go significantly higher. Why? Well, if everybody loves something and it's been going higher, who's left to buy? There's nobody left. Everybody already that's willing to buy has bought. It can't go any higher, right? So we love the hated trends. We love the, the those areas of the market. Let me take you through the devil's wager. So let's say hypothetically, that that we're going to go through this scenario with the devil. But first, I'm going to ask you a question. Is the wrong choice an error? Is the wrong choice an error? And think about that because most of you think that if you take the wrong trade, meaning you have a losing trade, you must have erred. And that's not true at all. You could have great trades that don't make money. And sometimes you'll have bad trades that make money. So you have to pay attention to how you're truly trading. The devil looks at, looks you in the eyes and offers you a bet. He says, pick a number that ranges between one and five. 
If you guess right, I will give to you one billion in gold. But if you guess wrong, then your soul is mine. So he says, pick a number between one and five. But here's the twist. Not all of the numbers are not equally divided. In other words, there's not an equal quantity. There's only one of every number, one through four. But there are ten fives. So you're going to pick these out of a hat. Which number would you choose if there were ten possible draws that could come back five and only one of the number one, one of the number two, one of the number three, and one of the number four? Well, logic says, of course I'm going to pick five, right? I'm going to pick five every time in that situation. Because if there are 14 numbers in the hat and ten of them are five, heck, I'm going to try that one. That has the highest probability of success. So we reach in there and we pick out a number. You choose the number five, but it happens to come out as the number four. The question is, did you make the wrong cho choice? Of course, in hindsight, you wish you had chosen the number four simply because of the outcome. But the outcome doesn't determine whether you made the right or the wrong choice. Do you see what I mean? In other words, if given that set of circumstances over time, you'd still pick five every time, not knowing what the outcome is going to be. Traders do this often where they'll look back at a trade and they'll say, I erred on this trade or I had a bad trade. And really, psychologically, that's not necessarily a good thing because you might have had a very good trade that didn't yield a positive result. Now, other times you'll look back on your trade and you'll say, you know what, I screwed this one up, okay? You can make mistakes and learn from that, but understand that the outcome of the trade might not really tell you whether you were in the right or the wrong trade, because I, I promise you, I would pick five in that situation every single time, and so should you, right? It gives you positive expectancy most of the time that's going to yield the best result. Even though any one scenario could give you the wrong result. And this is why we diversify. This is why we have to protect against too, too many losses. You know, even if we have a high probability strategy, we'll still have losing streaks. In fact, if you look at the numbers over 10,000 trades, even if you have a high success ratio, let's say that you get your trades right 60, 70% of the time, do you understand that even if you're right six or seven times out of 10, that you will statistically over 10,000 trades be guaranteed essentially to have 13 losers in a row at some point? So when we think about this, and we think about 13 losers in a row, this is kind of a magic number in the financial markets. 13 losses in a row is what you have to be able to stomach. Because that's kind of, it could get worse than that, but that's kind of a worst case scenario type of thing. Will you have plenty of times, I'm telling you, you will have a lot of times where you'll have five losses in a row, six losses in a row, seven losses in a row. So this gets into money management. We don't know when we're going to have a big losing streak. But we know if we trade long enough, it's bound to happen. Now, some of you would say, well, won't we have some massive winning streaks? In fact, won't we have more 13 wins in a row given our high probability? The answer is a resounding yes. You'll have more winners than losers. So you'll have bigger winning streaks than losing streaks. But it's always the protection that matters, right? We have to make sure that no matter what, we don't get knocked out of the game. So that 13 losses in a row is kind of the standard of what you have to protect against. That means that if you were to put, you know, statistically, if you basically put 10% of your money in every trade, you can't withstand the losses. You know, 13 losses in a row, losing 10% is basically going to knock you out. However, if you were to risk 1% or 2% of your account, value in every one trade. Can you stomach three, 13 losses in a row as kind of your worst case scenario? You can do it, right? So you can do that even, you know, those really bad losing streaks 
It's not going to feel good when you're in them. I promise you that. You're not going to feel great, but you can weather the storm. And that's so critical to trading. So let's not dwell on the fact that you're going towards pain and infinite and escapable future with this devil's wager. Let's think about your choice immediately before the number was chosen. Did you make a mistake? Was choosing the number five an error? Of course, the answer is no. You made the best choice that you could under the circumstances. And that's important. That's what we want you to do. It doesn't mean that every decision you make will be the right one. It means that given the choices, given the circumstances, you make the right choice at that particular time. And if you do that over time, the results will take care of themselves. So let's replace the devil's wager with the situations that the world presents you with and your choice of number with your actions in response. Now we have a handle on what psychologists mean when they talk about cognitive error or bias, right? So cognitive error or bias, when we come in, you know, that people will make decisions that just happen to turn out wrong when you talk about cognitive errors and bias. The interesting errors are decisions which people systematically get wrong and get wrong in a particular way. These are errors because they must be happening for a reason. So when you think about you know, errors in judgment and whatnot, you didn't make an error even though the result turned out against you, right? But you've got to look at it at, in terms of a bias. Let's change the scenario. What if you always chose the number two, no matter what? If you always chose the number two, even though they gave you this set of circumstances where there were 10 fives and only one two as a possibility, your bias is to always choose two. Now that's a big problem for you, isn't it? Because statistically, you, you're making the wrong decision. This is an error, right? This is a cognitive error. This is a bias, which you have, which will get you into trouble. So from the standpoint of trading, we do these same things. Does the market go down constantly? No. But are people biased in a very bearish manner to believe that the market's going to go down at almost any and all turns? Absolutely. There are perma bears out there that basically keep betting the number two even though there's only one two in there and there are ten fives. Do you see the difference? When we go into the markets with already a cognitive error, with already a bias in place, it's going to cloud our judgment and it's not going to allow us to see things clearly, right? We're going to make errors in judgment that way. So very, very important that we kind of set these biases aside. We can, you know, your opinion, your view, will oftentimes cloud your judgment. I used to have CNBC up all the time. And I have to tell you, some of the people that get on there are very compelling and convincing and they make a strong argument. And if you follow fundamentals, you know, I used to follow fundamentals in kind of the textbook way. Oh, low PE ratio. Well, that means it's trading inexpensively. It's fundamentally, you know, it's kind of safe. High P.E. ratio. Oh, it must be overvalued. Oh, you know, and, and you get all nervous. Well, the reality is, is that stocks that trade at high P.E. ratios that everybody calls overvalued, you'll notice they just keep going higher and higher. Prime example of this, Amazon. I can't tell you how many people just come on and scream all day long that Amazon is overvalued. They, you know, because they keep reinvesting in their business, they don't show anything for earnings. So their P.E. ratio is just sky high. They complain about the business, but understand that business is growing substantially. They've been stealing market share. They've been taking business away from the retailers and moving it to online sales. Now so many people actually just buy their products off of Amazon. So in other words, Everybody's focused on this bias, this fundamental outlook, when in reality, it's a hated trend. Everybody hated the idea that it just keeps going higher and higher, further and further overvalued in their mind, yet the trend is up. 
that is a great situation of you know th that bias that fear of and and kind of getting caught up in the the common thought the belief with everyone else would cloud your judgment to a great opportunity well amazon i think they reported earnings last week and went up seventy dollars per share on their earnings new all-time highs etc cetera, etc cetera. so let's be careful about those biases the gain the pain of a loss is greater than the joy of a gain do you bring past emotions and experiences into future trades so this is absolutely true the pain of a loss is greater than the joy of a gain this will make you what I think is the single largest mistake that people make in trading which is they hold their losers too long they cut their winners too short they're willing to take max losses but they rarely hold towards max gains and so as you do this over time if you do it incorrectly you just can't make money and it's usually because the pain of a loss is greater than the joy of a gain so understand what that does to you psychologically let's let's take an options example trade a we buy a five dollar spread and we pay two dollars for it so we have two dollars at risk and how much can we make well if it's a five dollar spread vertical spread and we paid two dollars for it then we must have three dollars of reward right because the most the spread can be worth is five and if we get five out of it minus our two dollar cost we've got three dollars of reward the least it can be worth is zero which means it expires worthless and we lose our two bucks so when we look at this five dollars of cost two dollars at risk and three dollars of reward think about how traders manage this position and think about what this means that the pain of a loss is greater than the joy of a gain so how will they manage it for most people they are going to manage this position in a way that creates bad results over the long haul what do I mean by that well most people will say I paid two dollars for it so I'll lose two dollars in it worst case scenario and they'll do that quite often right they'll hold it and it goes from two let's say it's worth two dollars when you get in it falls to a dollar maybe the trade quite clearly is not going to work but do they sell it here no they keep holding and they write it all the way down to zero maybe they should have cut the loss off you know maybe that it's okay if you're gonna hold all the way to expiration but only if you're willing to hold your gainers right they could have cut it off at a one dollar loss but they most people will say if I sell here at one understand I'm locking in my loss so that doesn't feel very good the potential of recovery in the future feels a lot better than locking in a loss here right it's painful to lock in a loss so maybe they should have cut it off at a dollar clearly it's not gonna work but instead they hold it all the way down to zero now let's flip this around they buy it at two dollars and it goes in their favor most people start to get very nervous very uncomfortable let's say it goes up to three dollars in value so they're up a buck here's what most people do they start to fear the worst case scenario they say boy it would have been painful to lose two dollars it'll be even more painful to lose three because now I've got a dollar of profit now I'm actually showing some gain and so they'll start to in their mind whether it's you know out in the open or just in their subconscious I promise you as human beings we start to think about worst case scenarios and we start to feel really uncomfortable with profitable positions and we say you know what I've got a dollar of profit you know we start coming up with these catchy little terms pigs make money but hogs get slaughtered and you know you never go broke taking a profit and all these little catchy things that actually will will do you damage because taking your profits too early 
will bankrupt you. It will cause problems. So naturally, we usually bail out on our trades too early. You know what? I'm up at a buck in this trade. I realize I could make $3 a profit, but I'm up a dollar. And the risk of losing the gain, or worse, is far worse than the potential reward of making two more. And please understand that if you're feeling like, man, he's talking to me, it, every one of us have this type of bias where we are, we are actually very okay with taking our original loss, but once we start to show a profit, it becomes very hard to keep holding the trade and keep waiting for more profits and more profits. So if you can control yourself, we say position sides towards max gain and max loss. You have to either decide you're one of two traders, in my opinion anyway. You're the trader that's going to hold everything to expiration. You're going to hold your $2 losses, but you're also going to make your $3 gains. You're either that type of trader where you're you're in this thing, but that only works. You can't be the $2 loss taker and the $1 reward gainer. Okay, that won't work. You have to make sure that your reward is greater than your risk over the long term. You can't take quick profits and hold for max losses. Or your trader B. Trader B says, I'm going to manage this in such a way that I buy it two. When I see it's not working, I stop it out at one. I keep my loss at one. Trader B says, I buy it two. It trades up to 450. I could try and squeeze out the extra 50 cents, but you know what? I cut my losses off when they're not working. I can hold I can cut it off at a little less than max gain when it is working. You either have to be the trader, but you always have to figure out a way so that your reward outpaces your risk. And so so many new traders try to be uh, the one that's willing to take the full loss, but they don't even understand they're not the guy that takes the full gain, and you just can't can't do that. Okay, you can't take small gains and max losses and have this work for you. So, do you bring past emotions and experiences into future trades? Absolutely. What happens when you know you could buy this at two, it trades up to three, and then what happens? Sometimes it will go all the way back to zero. I'm telling you, that's painful. So you had a profit, now you took, ended up taking a max loss. Will that happen from time to time and is that okay? Yes and yes. Okay, But here's the problem. When that happens to you, you're going to feel it. It's going to be painful. And so are you going to bring that emotion and that past experience into the next trade? Yeah, absolutely. You're going to tell yourself, you know what, that hurt. I'm not going to allow that to happen to me again. Please understand that you have to allow some pain to get some gain, right? Just like just like going to the gym. No pain, no gain. That's how it is in trading. There's going to be a little pain from losses. That that's, you know, that's out of the question. So, most people try to avoid it by simply saying I'll, I'll minimize the losses, right? I'll take, you know, I'll, I'll try to turn everything into a profit. You can't try to turn every trade into a profit. You know, it's the whole dollar cost averaging and things like that. Taking really small profits and trying to make everything profitable to avoid pain and losses altogether. You just can't do it. You have to figure out how you're going to stomach the losses, but maximize the gains to always be better. And if you'll do that, not worry about the emotions of it, put your emotions on the side, not try to protect yourself from some losses that will happen from time to time, and just simply trade the right way, you'll end up with better results. So strategy optimization. Maybe your strategy is optimized for a different environment. Right, so if you love fast foods, there could be kind of a a background, uh, kind of an explanation for that, where it's it's something like you know your cravings evolved at a point in history when starvation was 
a bigger risk than obesity. In other words, you might be wired a certain way. Some people have come into the markets with more conservative backgrounds. They tend to be conservative and, you know, really careful and cautious. Other people come into the markets very aggressive, a risk taker, willing to risk it all, right? And and we might be wired a certain way. I promise you that as human beings, we're not all wired the exact same way. For example, I tend to be on the conservative side of things. So I tend to you know, I don't know if it was because I've worried about, you know, making ends meet for my family or whatever it was, but back in the in my 20s, I told this story. In my 20s, I'm I'm quite conservative in that, you know, I'll take risks. I mean, obviously I trade on the financial markets, but everything I made, I wanted to store it away. I wanted to put it towards something where I felt like I was building something. So, my wife and I decided we were going to we got married in our 20s. And I said, everything I make, I'm going to pour back into our mortgage. I'm just going to pay it off as soon as possible. Now, if you're a real estate investor, you're probably thinking, well, that's not a very good idea because, you know, you could buy more homes and leverage up and yada, yada, yada. The risk taker would say, you're playing it way too conservative, pouring all that cash into what ultimately you know, might not be a, a rapidly appreciating value. You could do it better other ways. But I said, forget that. I'm making money in the financial markets as I trade, as I do these things. I'm going to pour the profits back into my mortgage. And here was my conservative thought. If I can pay off my mortgage, which is my single largest expense, then a lot of my stress level goes down dramatically, right? So our goal was before we before we turn 30, before I turn 30 specifically, we were going to have this thing paid off. Well, fast forward, of course, once once we achieve that goal and, and literally did it, I, I'm a believer that if you write down goals, if you truly focus on them and work towards them, you can achieve them. Well, of course, as soon as we had that paid off, what do we do? We went out and bought another house and upgraded. And I have four kids. I've probably told you that before. So we needed a, a larger home. But we still own that home today that we paid off. So the the conservatism in me basically says, well, now I have an asset that I can rent out. And it's it, the rent from that is basically paying this new mortgage. So it kind of worked in that way of taking a big amount of stress out of my life, right? And now the goal is we upgraded more expensive home and so forth, but still to pay that off because I'm making money in the financial markets, but there are certain levels where you want to make that money stick and own assets and just kind of simplify in your life. So the conservative guy goes towards that route early. The more aggressive guy says, why would I want to do that when I can make more money on all of this money? So I'll keep the high mortgage. I'll keep this. I'll keep that. And they'll leverage up. Well, that's clearly the more risky spot to be in. But where there's risk, there's reward. That person, their net worth has the potential to grow a whole lot faster than mine does. But when 2009 hits, 2008 hits, you know, and there's credit crisis and things like that, I can make it through where others may not survive. So again, you have to right now figure out where you lie on kind of that conservative and aggressive spectrum. If you're aggressive, you have to protect against yourself. If you're conservative, you have to push yourself to take a little more risks and you have to kind of find that that sweet spot of where you should be. And so you know, again, as human beings, we might come in with certain inclinations. Another example of this, if you started trading in a bear market and you experience some success with that, you're going to develop a more permanent bearish mentality. You know, you're going to develop uh, a certain mentality right, right now. I mean, I would say that a lot of people are more bearish on markets than than maybe we've ever seen, which is something that's made me very bullish for the last few years. And I've, I keep making this argument. I call it, there's a bubble in those predicting a bubble. 
if there's one bubble out there, it's the bearish argument bubble, which has been going on for years. Now, I'm not arguing that we won't see bear markets and that things won't get bad from time to time and so forth. But I still think we go massively higher in the markets before we go lower. How many average individuals really are involved and trust the markets and investing in it? How many people out there are really in that spot? I would say as much as I've ever seen before, there are just so many people that don't trust the markets, don't trust the Fed, don't trust this and that and the other. And there might be some justification to that, but everything I've ever studied in the financial markets tells me the trend has been higher. They're going to blow this thing to the top. They're going to force buyers to come in chasing the market, you know, that greed factor, and that the market will eventually top out in kind of a, a more dramatic fashion, a more very bullish scenario playing out and people getting very, very optimistic about the market. So anyway, recognize those biases and make sure that you don't just keep betting against it. I mean, anybody that just keeps betting bearish, bearish, bearish over and over again for the past few years, they have not survived. And it's just it just doesn't make sense to fight trends and fight momentum too much. So, you know, pay attention to those biases. Be aware of your tendencies, habits. Develop a strong trading plan to protect against it and follow your rules. We'll send Mr. T at you. So trading psychology. Negative habits such as framing, anchoring, and confirmation bias can be developed and formed early in a trading career and can be detrimental to one's equity curve. So we're going to look at those three, framing, anchoring, and confirmation bias. Make sure that you recognize times where you've maybe made these mistakes and take corrective actions. We're going to start with framing. Framing is how you decide which stock to buy, when to buy it. And once you've made the decision to buy, when to sell. Now, I usually say that from the standpoint of trading, getting out of a trade is far more difficult than the, de the decision to get in. Because the decision to get in, we can set our parameters and wait for just what we're looking for. But we don't get a wait for the you know, perfect setups and patterns because it may never materialize for getting out of a trade. So... These questions of framework, how we answer them are a direct result of how we frame the question and thus impact our trading performance. Framing determines the viewpoint from which we look at an issue such as a stock chart and then filter stuff out where we determine what's important and what's not. If we've not created a frame or if the frame constantly changes, to satisfy emotional imbalances, then our performance will suffer accordingly. So let's show an example. Here's the here's a chart of the S&P 500. Now, uh, if we were to continue this chart, it's actually been down for the last few days. Down here, it's down around 2050, I think, right now. So it's kind of like that. But anyway, the framework. What do we use to determine what's important and what's not? How do we filter out significant factors, right? So we come in with a certain framework to determine what matters and what does not. So for me, you know, I've talked about this easy, simple scoring system that protects me from betting too much against bull markets and too much for bear markets and so forth, meaning I don't want to be buying while we're clearly trending lower and I don't want to be selling short when we're cl quite clearly going higher. So take an example of this recent rally. This has been a huge move off of the bottom and it's been one of the most hated rallies I can remember in a very very long time. But if you think about the framework for what's important, you know, should you have been bearish every step of the way? No. When Maverick, I remember a few months ago when I actually did one of the trading rooms and we had a, a positive two. And I said at the time that I thought that we could see just a gigantic rally with how bearish people were. But in addition to that, we were seeing positive signs of momentum. So for example, here's a very big expanded range 
bullish candle, aggressive buying. In addition to that, so you're above the 50, which I would give a plus one. You're above the 20, which I give a plus one. And the 20, which is this dotted blue line, is sloping upward, which I give a plus one. So from a technical standpoint, I like to use these short-term moving averages. If you're above both the 20 and 50, you get a plus one for each of those. And I always look at the slope of the 20. Back here, when the slope of the 20 was down, you get a negative one. And the price was below the 20 and below the 50. So that would have been a negative three or a very bearish scenario. So here's a negative three area, right? Here's a pot where it turned clearly into a positive three above the 50, and it's been in basically a positive three almost until now, right? Positive three every step of the way the past few months. This is a framework where we say what's important and what's not. Filtering out the insignificant and building a framework that, that doesn't cloud our judgment. By doing that, again, I always like to think it's the George Costanza approach to the markets. What is the prevailing sentiment? Sentiment is how just people feel about things. So there's a couple of different scenarios, right? People can feel bad and you can have a bad market. Well, there's no real trade there other than to short it because if you're in a bad trend, a downtrend, and people feel bad, well, we could still go lower. Or you could have good and good, meaning people feel good about the markets. It's already reflected in the price action. And prices are going up. Well, there's no real trade there other than to trade it to the upside, right? Sentiment positive, markets positive. But I find that the best trades, I, I mean, I'm telling you, the best opportunities are when a market is hated like it was as we started to break out here. So you had very bad sentiment, but you had very good price action. And that is a recipe for bullish trading. The same way that when people are quite optimistic and bullish and the market starts to break down, if people are too optimistic, right, too, too bullish, but the price action is bad, so you've got good sentiment but bad price action, you usually fall lower and it's a great area to be bearish. So I kind of think about how I feel about the markets. How just, you know, you get in the in the taxi cab and the cab driver starts to tell you about what he, you know, what he's going long and what he thinks is going up significantly and then you well, I'll give you an example. Here's a perfect example of this what I'm talking about. I play basketball in the mornings a couple of times a week. And these are guys that they know I work in the financial markets. So we rarely talk about that. But one particular morning, uh, when we first get in there, we just kind of shoot around and, and talk before the games began. And one of the guys was a dentist. And he said, and this was late 2014 when oil just started to break down. So oil was at $100 a barrel, broke to probably 70 at the time. So it, it was down hard and everybody knew it and gas prices kind of fell to the downside. And he says to me, how do I buy oil futures? How do I take advantage of oil? Because it's definitely going back up. Our gas prices are going to get jacked right back up. Oil prices, they won't let it stay down. And I thought, you know, that, that's kind of interesting. Guy with just no real interest, just a passing interest. But his bias is that oil can only stay up, it always goes higher. Okay, kind of thought about that for a little bit. Interesting, bad sentiment, or pardon me, good sentiment for oil, even though bad price action. Literally, I think it was two days later, this was around Thanksgiving, I remember I'm with my family, my brother, again, has a passing interest in the markets almost says the same thing verbatim. He says, hey, how do we buy oil, you know, oil for it to go back up? I think he even referenced oil futures. It's going to go right back up. You know, what, what do we do here? Because that's the best trade. And again, I said, my goodness, the public perception 
is that oil only goes up, that it's strong, that it's stable. In other words, the sentiment is so good towards oil, even though the price action is so bad. And I can remember making bear, very, very bearish trades and said, you know what, this is a this is a trend that basically it's a downtrend that people don't believe in, which creates opportunity. And I would tell anybody that would listen, bet against oil. We talked about it in the FX market, short Canada, short the Canadian dollar. We talked about, you know, trading energy equities to the downside, et cetera, et cetera. Because you had the trend falling, but everybody expecting, oh, it's going to come back. It's great. It's fine. You know, the same thing happened in the financial crisis. Oh, you know, Citigroup's a great company. Bank of America, this. You know, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, this is the world markets. These companies have been around for decades. General Motors can't go down any further. It won't bankrupt, yada, 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 right? You hear that argument where it's very good sentiment towards something that's trading so very, very bad. And things normally get a whole lot worse. Well, what did oil do? From 70 to 60, 50, 40, 30, you get the point. Massive deterioration, huge unwind, forced liquidations. Selling begets more selling, and it's the, the George Costanza of things. One of the things I've been doing with our traders that I work with is to say, when you're doing your scans, you'll find yourself in a couple of situations. You'll find yourself, as you scan, saying things like, well, that's too high or that's too low. Your, your natural instinct is to say, that's too high to buy it, right? Or that's too low to sell it. I can't short that. I can't play it bearish. It's already down too much. When I find myself saying that, I want to take those trades, meaning, oh, that's, that's too high. I can't buy it here understand look at this chart of the S&P you'd have said well you know it's up too much here shouldn't have bounced this high or this high or this you know it's just up it's it's gone too high I'll wait for it to pull back hard you know maybe then I'll buy and every step of the way it kept going higher and higher and higher right so one when, when you are doing your scans those are the hard trades to take it's hard to buy something that's really strong just like it's hard to short something that's really weak because psychologically we think something that's low must be valuable must be a great buying opportunity and we think something that's high must be overdone and overvalued and oh I could never buy that I'm a I'm a great shopper you know and so understanding that as you do your scans if you find yourself saying that's too high or that's too low there's probably a great trading opportunity there those are the hard trades to take. And if you will find a way to figure out the hard trades, and usually you'll just instinctively kind of say something that tells you the hard trades. We had a trader uh, that just yesterday said, you know, I was in this trade and I was up 100 pips and I wanted to add to the trade. I wanted to, he was trading the FX markets, but he said, I wanted to add to it, but I couldn't add to it because it was too high. And I said, that's your answer right there. You just said you can't add to it because it was going too well, because it was too strong, because it was too, you know, it, too everything you wanted. That is not how the markets work. And I said, that's exactly where you should have added to it. And without knowing, I said, where's it at right now? And he said, well, it's up 200 pips now. In other words, he would have added to the trade and it would have gone double the profit that he had. I'm telling you, it works in the financial markets. You've got to understand that. Now, there is a difference between that and the trader that says, you know, I hate this market. I hate this market and it goes higher. 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 And then he finally says, this is ridiculous. I cannot believe I've been betting against it all this time. I can't miss out on this any longer, and he finally buys. Okay, that is greed. That's the fear of missing out. That's basically what we call capitulation. There's a very big difference between doing your scans and trading and positioning and saying, you know, that's too high or that's too low. That's, that's your signal, right? As opposed to, 
I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I can't do this anymore. All right, I love it. That's capitulation. So don't understand there's two big differences between saying something is just kind of, uh, it feels too high, too high to buy, or I can't miss out on this anymore. If you'll recognize the difference there, the one that you can't miss out on any longer, don't get into that trade. That tells you you're more towards the top and the bottom when people start capitulating in that manner. Next, after framing comes anchoring. Similar to how a house should be built upon a good, solid foundation, our ideas and opinions should be based on relevant and correct facts in order to be considered valuable or valid. However, this is not always so, right? So when we think about this anchoring principle, a lot of people will anchor to things that maybe don't matter or maybe only get them in trouble. So for example, some investors, you know, the concept of anchoring here draws on the tendency to attach or to anchor our thoughts to a reference point, even though it may have no logical relevance to the decision at hand. It may seem unlikely, but we're pretty prevalent to do this when we're dealing with concepts like trading, anything that's new or novel. You know, the, the anchoring that I often see people make is preconceived beliefs about a lot of these businesses so and I do I know I do this and so I do the George Costanza thing where I try and turn it around for example you know you find a company that maybe has been around forever right General Motors uh, IBM Bank of America whatever the company may be it's been around forever and we start to get this belief that you know these are these are great companies these are great businesses these are this that and we're very slow to recognize changes in that business we're very recognize slow to recognize what really matters to trading it and we anchor to past ideas about it right so if our belief is, is that general motors is a great American business and it's you know phenomenal we're gonna have a very hard time trading at bearish as we should when the price action starts to break down we're not gonna trade it the right way because we have this preconceived kind of notion and a lot of people missed out on great trading in 2008 shorting things and playing bearish because they just kept thinking everything was gonna bounce back you know it's gonna bounce back these are great businesses and whatnot and then once things got so horribly bad that basically it was all priced into the markets, by that point, everybody had become so bearish and so scared and curled up into a ball that then they couldn't make money as the markets recovered over the past number of years, right? Because you have to understand that the markets will push your sentiment to an area that you feel uncomfortable in. That's exactly what the markets do. They're going to make you feel bad about good situations and they're going to make you feel good about bad situations. That's just that's just the way it works. So investors will often say, you know, they'll anchor to prior price points. They'll think that something that was way up and at a high price point and has come down significantly is a better value than something that's going up. Let me give you an example. If you had two stocks, one was, you know, they're both at $20 a share, but let's talk about how they got there. One came down from 80. So it went from 80, 70, 60, 50, all the way down to 20. The other stock is making new all-time highs at $20 per share. Those are very different scenarios. As human beings, we all feel more comfortable buying the stock that went from 80 to 20. And that company might be IBM, General Motors, Bank of America, whatever, something that we feel comfortable with, right? We think, oh, it's going to be such a great value, such a great American story, right? So we buy it, but we're anchoring to a higher price. And we think, well, it was trading at 80, so it'll go back there. You know, we anchor to something that's insignificant. Understand that business might have just taken a massive hit. They may never go back to that price point. And if they do, it's going to take a very long time. Why? Because they have 
overhead supply, what we call dead bodies weighing on that. So think about it. If you fall from 80 to 20, how many people bought at higher prices? You have people that bought at 21, 22, 23, all the way up to 80. That's sellers. Those are people that want their money back. They want to get back to break even. And as you try to climb higher, they're dumping their dead shares onto the market. As opposed to the stock that's hitting 20, now it might be a company that you hate, right? It might be a company that you think is ridiculous. It might be Zanga or, you know, Facebook or LinkedIn or some of these, you know, that 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 people just maybe not Facebook, but some of these where, you know, I know from my own experience, I thought, you know, Zanga, these companies that are coming out, King Digital, they make these little games for your phone and whatnot. You might just hate the story, but that asset keeps going higher and higher and it breaks to new all-time highs. You give me that scenario, I'll buy the stock that's breaking at new all-time highs at 20 bucks for the trade every time over the stock that's come down dramatically. I don't care. This one's Zanga and that one's General Motors. You feel much better about General Motors. That's exactly why you should buy the one that's breaking to new highs that you hate the idea of buying and it's going to be a great trade most of the time. Anchoring can be a source of frustration in the financial world as investors base their decisions on irrelevant figures and stats. After careful consideration of all 437 charts, graphs, metrics, throwing up our hands, hitting the liquor store, getting snockered, who's with me, right? We want to anchor to things that matter. Great example of anchoring, 2008 crisis. I can't tell you how many people kept coming on and saying, buy Citigroup, buy AIG, buy Lehman Brothers, buy Bear Stern, great American businesses, buy General Motors, buy... You know, whatever it, what it, it was, Citigroup on a reverse split adjusted basis. This is because they reverse split, which means they did a 10 for 1. The stock went down from effectively 500 to its $46 share price. And many of those companies did not survive. So if they had not done the reverse split, you'd be looking at a stock that fell from 500 and would now be trading at $4.67 or whatnot. In other words, it's down dramatically. It's a well-known business, been around forever. That doesn't make it a great buying opportunity, some great value, or anything else. Understand that in trading, if you can get yourself to take the hard trade, and the hard trade was to just keep betting against Citigroup while it was in that downward slide every step of the way, you can make a lot of money in the financial markets. But you have to be willing to take the hard trade, recognize when you find yourself saying, it's too high, it's too low, and instinctively say, hey, that's my trigger. That's what tells me that there's real momentum, that there's actually better opportunities with this position. Finally, the last thing, confirmation bias. Also called my side bias. This is a tendency for people to favor information that confirms their preconceptions or expectations rather than just looking at things objectively. People, people tend to gather evidence or recall information selectively only if it helps their cause. They interpret it in a biased way. Okay, This is especially true for emotionally significant issues or established beliefs. So let me give you an example of confirmation bias. When we think about prices, you know, moving a certain way, gold, if we were to back this chart out a long time frame, gold went up dramatically in the years preceding this. In fact, if you go back to the early mid 2000s, gold was at like $400 an ounce, then it went to 500, 700, 900, you know, broke a thousand. 1200 40. This is basically where gold was topping out in, back in 2011, 2012. It actually was a little higher than this. It was 2011, and it topped out at, at 180 something, which is $1,800 an ounce in gold. But understand how it got there. Gold was going up in a period where people weren't as inclined to pay attention, right? So it was going up, and it was kind of a hated market move. Everybody thought, you know, it's just a waste of time to, to invest in gold. 
you know, why waste your time? Why waste your money? It's ridiculous. And it kept going higher. 2006, 2007, you know, it's going up. It's trending higher. And it, there wasn't really this big fad and this, this opinion and this aggression towards buying it. But then something happened. We had the financial crisis hit. We had, you know, currency devaluation. We had all these things that started to come out and there started to become much better sentiment. So the best investable area was back there when people hated it and it was trending higher, right? Bad sentiment, but good price action. We love it. But then the sentiment started to really turn good towards gold and it kept trending higher for a little while. And it was going up 1400 an ounce, 1500 and you'd see all the commercials and everything. And it was quite clearly a bull market. Silver also zooming to the upside understand what was happening right the price action was going up during that period of time because aggressive buying but actually this is kind of your classic buy the rumor sell the news on a very long-term basis once gold hit a point where everything that should have been good for gold actually started to come true that's exactly where it started to fall. Think about it. Quantitative easing was first announced in 2011. Gold topped out in 2011. Silver topped out in 2011. There should be nothing more bullish for gold than that, right? I mean, that was what, it, what we've been waiting for. That's exactly why you should be buying it. Here's the important principle. Markets are a discounting mechanism. And a lot of times we don't know why they're doing what they're doing, and that's okay. I love the hated trend that keeps working, right? Once people started to really fall in love with gold and kept buying it and buying it, and it turned more parabolic, straight up, in other words, instead of more steady, then you knew that times were getting a little too good, right? You still can't short it. You're certainly not betting against it, but you know that's how bull markets go to die. So we kept going up, and then as soon as the best case scenario for gold started to be announced, gold broke trend. Now, confirmation bias is going and finding reasons that gold should still be going up. Could you find them? Absolutely. So we turn to CNBC, and somebody comes on and says, well, with quantitative easing, gold has to go higher because they're devaluing this, they're printing money, you know, it's a yada, yada, yada. And gold goes a little bit lower. And then somebody comes else comes on and says, you should invest in gold. Because not only is the U.S. doing quantitative easing, but so is Japan and Europe. And gold goes lower. And then, you know, more reason. And it just keeps going down and down and down. Could you find all sorts of confirmation bias? Can you go find a million articles on why gold should be going higher, even as it keeps trending lower and lower and lower over the past few years? Absolutely. Understand, that's not hard to find somebody that's bullish or somebody that's bearish on anything, right? But you have to look at this from the standpoint of objectively. Now that people love it, now it's become great sentiment and very very bad price action and that's not a good combination and they will punish those late buyers they will liquidate those shares this will turn into you know more of a downward trend that's just the normal process of markets and it's gone down 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 every step of the way and now maybe people have given up on gold thrown up their hands and said you know what you can't keep buying it here it's a waste of time yada 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 and now we're starting to go up. Well, I don't really want to make too much of an argument for gold one way or another, but I would say it was quite clear that the sentiment was way too bullish at the peak, and it had been bearish for most of the run, and now it was good sentiment, positive expectations all the way down, and that just created a perfect scenario where people were way too optimistic, too positive, and it went down. Don't get caught in the confirmation bias game. As I said before, you can go and find someone that agrees with your trade. You know, what you should be paying attention to is are you making 
psychologically the right decisions. So let me kind of tie a ribbon on this and say the following. First, the best thing you can do for yourself is to find the hard trade. And the hard trade is something that has bad sentiment but good price action and you keep trading it higher. You keep trading that stock to be good. Or really good sentiment where people are expecting positive things and bad price action and you keep trading that to the downside. There is opportunity there. When you find yourself saying, well, this is too high to buy, that's what you'd have said about gold every step of the way because it went from 500 to 700 to 900 to 1100 to 1300 to 1500. Every step of the way, I promise you, I felt like, oh, it's too high. You got to buy it. You got to buy it. You got to buy it, right? Once the sentiment turned really good, we get a little more cautious, but we still have to keep buying it. It's up. Once the trend turned, you'd have felt like, oh, it's down too far. I can't short it. You know, it's funny how people get stuck in this. I can't do anything because they didn't want to buy it when it was, you know, too high. And they don't want to short it now that it starts to fall. Even though it only fell from 1,800 ounce to 1,500 an ounce, you think that, man, that was, that was a big move. So it must be too low right now. No, it collapsed from 1,500 down to 14, down to 13, down to 12, down to 11, you know, down here close to $1,000 an ounce again. It felt too low to short it every step of the way, and it's exactly what you should have done. The kind of the George Costanza. Now, recognize when you're chasing. If you ever say to yourself, I'm late to the trade, you know, I can't miss out on this any longer, well, don't do anything with that one. Don't. Don't you know? get yourself in that situation where if you've missed the trade and you keep kicking yourself, don't finally chase in. If you find yourself finally buying or finally selling because you've been missing all of that run and you feel terrible about it, well, you're probably exactly at the, at the peak or the, the trough of that. So skip, skip out on that one. All right. We're going to finish where we started to remind you that a man should never be ashamed to say he's been wrong, which is but saying, in other words, that he is wiser today than he was yesterday. I really, truly believe that if you'll recognize those those sentiments that you have about the markets, how you manage money, right, where your willingness to take losses, you know, they're painful, so you try to make everything a profit, or you take your profits way too early and, and keep your losses big because you keep trying to let them come back, let them come back. You think that by letting them come back and you pile up these bigger losses, you know, you're giving yourself an out and an opportunity to not feel the pain. The best trading is to, is to effectively always make the pain, even though the pain won't go away and it's always bigger than the, the joy of the gain, make the pain a reasonable number. If you can't sleep at night, you've got too big of a position size, right? Early in your trading, of course, you're just going to be excited about about the markets. But after a while, trading should get boring. It should be something where you're not doing stuff to get excited. You're not doing stuff to have fun. You're just doing it to make money. And as you start to trade that way, you make sure that your losses are always smaller than your rewards. You'll have great success with it. I am very confident about that. Great to see all of you again. I hope this helps with our psychology, and we'll see you all next time. Goodbye, everyone.